Okay, so let's get started today. So today we're talking about cultural innovations, right? We just uh, we just finished talking about the social changes that are happening in the United States in the 1920s. You have the rise of the liberated woman, right? You have women taking jobs, uh, women going to college at higher rates and going into careers at higher rates. You have uh, you have greater freedoms and liberties for the LGBTQ community. You have uh, this really young, youthful revolution happening in, in social settings, right? Um, and it creates a lot of tension. There is this tension between young and old, new and old, uh, excuse me, traditional. These traditional values versus um, this new morality, right? There's a lot of tension rising in social settings. And that tension is also evident in some of the cultural innovations of the time. Things like art and writing, poetry, uh, movies, radio, all of those social tensions, right? That, that, that battle happening in the social world makes its way over into the cultural realm. But the cultural innovations tend to serve as a glue to keep the country united, right? In despite all of this tension, despite all of this turmoil, all of this new stuff happening, these cultural innovations come around and, and help to keep the nation, uh, excuse me, the nation united. All right. So here we go. Let's look at it. So we know, we know um, that the 1920s are a time full of changes and innovations, right? And, and these changes spark an artistic movement in the United States as well. Um, there have been other artistic movements in the United States. I am, I will say up front, I am no art expert, right? Like I am not the one to teach you about art very well. Um, I know enough, right? Um, if you want to take art history, take art history your junior or your senior year next year with Miss Oliver. But I, I don't know a ton about art. I know enough. And some of you are gonna be asking yourself, this is a history class. Why in the world are we gonna be talking about art and writing and all that today? And, and it's a fair question because I'm not an English teacher, right? I, I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not an art history teacher. I, I don't know film very well. Like, but what I do know is I know that throughout history, the art and entertainment that a society chooses to partake in, the art and entertainment that a society creates often reflects deeper themes happening in that society. And we know a lot about the 1920s and you're going to see it in the art and you're gonna see these patterns we've been talking about present in the art as well. And so again, I'm no art expert. I'm sure that when I say American modern art, I'm sure that has a different meaning today. I'm sure 2020 modern American art is different than 1920s modern American art. So just know today, if I say modern art, I'm talking about 1920s American modern art, okay? Um, much like the women, uh, members of the LGBTQ community and the youth of the 1920s uh, pushed previous social boundaries, so too did the artists, writers, filmmakers, musicians, and entertainers of the 1920s. They, they, the 1920s see the rise of new styles in art, new styles in writing, um, and, and they push those creative boundaries. Um, one example is this painting you see here at the top, Black Mesa Landscape by George O'Keefe, right? Um, clearly, if you look at that, if you've ever been outside and ever been somewhere where there are mountains, um, if you've seen them, and then you look at this painting, you know, hey, those got to be mountains. But they're not photorealistic, right? They don't, they don't look exactly like a mountain. They're not super detailed to the point that you're like, is that a photograph or is that a painting? They're, they're very much loose. Their interpretations and we're going to talk about the colors. We're going to talk about why those things, uh, why those artistic choices are made. But a painting like that is very, very indicative of this 1920s modern art. Um, and then the, you can see the image there of a, a picture of a silent theater, right? And the way we know it's a silent theater is because when was the last time you went to a movie theater and there was a guy playing piano in the front under the screen? Um, probably never. Right. If unless you know some silent film 
theater that you and your hipster friends frequent. Um, but uh, this is a silent film. Those those are uh, men wearing suits and ties in that image. Those are women wearing hats and dresses. Uh, going to the movie theater was a big deal. You got dressed up. Um, nowadays, you're lucky if people, you know, they, they're probably just wearing sweats and a sweatshirt. Like, why not? Go comfy. Um, but the advent of the silent film, right? The advent of the movie theater, uh, the movie theater is going to change culture. It's going to change people's lives. We'll talk more about it when we get to the Great Depression. Uh, but more people went to the movie theaters during the Great Depression than they did prior to that. Even when they had little money, even when, even when you know, the Great Depression, things were tight. The movie theater still remained a central point of connection, a central point of culture. Um, and all of that begins in the 1920s. So here we go. We're going to start with art and literature. Um, and so, again, artists and writers, we've said this, we've said this countless times, right? Whether it's women, whether it's the young, whether it's uh, different social groups. In this case, it's artists and writers. Artists and writers in the 1920s challenged many of the traditional uh, ideas in art, in, in society, uh, you name it. And a lot of them moved to places like Greenwich Village or Chicago's South Side to, to create. Um, and, and we talked about Greenwich Village last time, right? Greenwich Village also became a safe haven for the LGBTQ community in the 1920s. And so Greenwich Village really becomes a hub of art, it becomes an, uh, a hub of creativity. It becomes a hub for very creative minded people ex and, and people exploring new boundaries, whether that's new boundaries in art, new boundaries in social behaviors, new boundaries in their identity, new parts of their identity, whatever it is, Greenwich Village really becomes this, this uh, central hub of creativity and, and art in the 1920s. And if you any of you have been around creative minded people, right, they tend to be very eccentric and unconventional. I am not creative in the slightest, right? I cannot draw, I cannot like, I can't clap on beat, so like music's out, right? Like, I, I don't know any of that, right? I couldn't tell you the difference between like a chord and a note, I, I don't know anything, right? Um, like today, when you hear me describe art, I know enough about describing this art to get by, right? But like, you throw me in a museum and be like, go. And I'm like, that's a sculpture moving on, right? Like I'm not creative, but I know people who are creative and the, they look at the world in a different way. When they see something, they see opportunity. They see ways that that thing can be um, manipulated to become even more beautiful to them, right? I look at the world and I see analytics. I see data. I see things that I can quantify and research, right? That's how my mind works. But creative minds, um, are, I'm fascinated by them because they see things in such a different way. And they can often find joy and other creative methods in a lot of different things, right? And so places like Greenwich Village and Chicago's South Side in the 1920s, they become havens for this unconventional artist lifestyle, this constantly creating, constantly uh, adapting lifestyle. And they become places where these creators can explore greater degrees of freedom and expression in their work. They can push artistic boundaries. What is fine art, right? Um, is this stuff that's gonna get hung in palaces in Europe? Probably not. Is that where they want it hung? No, they want it in art galleries like the one you see there, uh, just somewhere off the off a random street in New York, right? Like their audience is not the same as traditional fine art. This is a time of, of just free creativity, if you will. We have a word for it. We describe this lifestyle, uh, this unconventional way as bohemian, right? So if you've ever heard the word bohemian, uh, bohemian tends to refer to this lifestyle, this unconventional artist lifestyle, this, this very free and expressive lifestyle. If any of you are fans of the um, Broadway musical Rent, right, um, this word will make more sense to you because they very much live a bohemian lifestyle, right? This very creative, everyone's doing their own thing, co very collective community type lifestyle, right?
Modern art in the 1920s in America is heavily influenced by European art movements, but it doesn't copy them, right? It takes pieces of many different movements and puts them together. You have um, artists who are influenced by cubism, right? A lot of them influenced by surrealist paintings and impressionist paintings. Um, and, and it comes together in this kind of amalgamated mashup of art. And we end up with American modern art focusing more on trying to portray inner moods and feelings of people than the actual reality of what they see, right? They're painting landscapes, but it's less about the mountains. It's more about the colors, the lines, and the feelings, right? Um, for those of you that struggle with poetry, that for those of you that struggle with like very creative art, um, to understand it, welcome, welcome to the club. I'm there with you, right? Um, like uh, Ulysses up there has uh, the be a beautiful painting of the Last Supper on his wall. Like, I think that's what it is. That's what it looks like it is. Like, I get that painting. That painting's pretty straightforward, right? Um, it, it's very clear what is in that painting. But we're going to look at some of these paintings in a minute that I'm like, I don't understand how you made that. I don't understand how that's supposed to be what you say it is, but cool. Like I can appreciate it that it took work, right? There's a difference. This art is more, in, is intended more so to create feelings, to, 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 to communicate the mood than to actually portray life. And that'll make more sense when we, when we look at it in a minute. Um, they very much take after the surrealist and impressionist paintings. Um, if you're not familiar with sur surrealism, I, I, I can't remember the artist. Um, yeah, no, I can't remember the artist, but there's a famous painting. Um, it's a surrealist painting uh, that contains, um, it's a lot of uh, clocks. And if you've ever seen it, you would know it because these clocks are melting and I can't remember. I know it's a, a Spanish painter, um, but the clocks are melting, right? And, and that's part of that surrealism, surrealism, wants to show uh, things that could exist in reality. A clock exists. We all know what a clock is, but they tend to show them in, in unrealistic ways. Again, a, a clock melting away. Um, that's not going to happen, right? And so surrealism, again, it's less about reality. It's more about that surreal, that, that just out there kind of stuff, right? And impressionist, again, uh, it's more about the feeling than the, than the actual uh, photo realism of the painting. These modern American artists tend to use uh, color, shapes, and lines to portray the inner world of people's emotions, moods, and relationships to the outer world. Again, it's less about the visual reality of the world and more so about these, these relationships, these moods, these emotions. And as such, this art was difficult for the public to appreciate. Again, think about it. Think about the long history of global art, right? Go back to the, to the Mesopotamians, go back to the ancient Assyrians, go back to the Romans, right? Think about the legacy in Italy alone of art, right? From the Romans up through, uh, you know, people like Michelangelo. And just think about the, the, the crazy history of Italian art, right? And then insert these brand new upstart American artists who are combining all of this stuff, living in these very creative environments and just throwing stuff out there. And it's, it's a very stark difference in the art. And so the public has a very hard time understanding and appreciating it often. Um, and part of that is because a lot of this art is often very discouraging. A lot of modern 1920s American art depicts society as fragmented and as and, and when it paints people, it often portrays these individuals as isolated. And again, think about what we've been talking about, right? We're historians in this class. We need to know about these artistic movements because these artistic movements tell us about society. They tell us about the people. If the art is depicting society as fragmented and individuals as isolated, 
can we as historians find credible evidence that this depiction of society is accurate, that this depiction of individuals is accurate? And the answer is yes. Think about everything we've been talking about. The decade starts, if you just look at the politics, the decade starts with a political shift in ideology. The country abandons the progressive movement and moves towards a more conservative uh, political ideology. You see the, the tension between uh, government and business, between labor uh, and, and the owners, right? You see the unions at tension with their bosses. You see, uh, again, in the 1920s, you see the entire agricultural uh, industry in this country in a steady depression the entire decade. We talked about the, the cultural difference, right? Again, if you look at the surface of the 1920s, it looks like people are making more money, people are doing better. But as soon as you dive deeper, we see that African-Americans are getting left behind. We see that farmers are getting left behind. We see that immigrants are getting left behind. Think about just what we talked about in the last lecture. You have this rise of this younger generation that's pushing social boundaries, that's extending the, the roles for women, extending uh, the ability for the LGBTQ community to, to live and, and foster and, and, and just and grow, right? You have this tension because then there's on the flip side of that, you have the more traditional crowd. You have the older generation, the more uh, religious fundamentalists, right? They are at tension with each other. Society is absolutely fragmented in the 1920s. And so as historians, when we look at this art, when we talk about these art movements, it's not for us so much about the art critique. That's not our job. Our job is to see how, how society's realities have seeped their way into the popular culture of art and, and music and whatnot, right? So let's look at some of these paintings. Uh, this first one, Lower Manhattan, John Mayer in 1920, right? Um, it is, a, it's a cityscape, right? A landscape, an urban landscape. Um, and, and if your eye was immediately drawn up here, um, that's by design. Um, if you didn't know this, your eyes are our eyes, not just your eyes, my eyes too. Our eyes are naturally drawn to, to light. Uh, they are naturally drawn to the brightest thing um, in art, but in, in life, right? Like even when I look at the screen and I'm looking at your faces, um, like, my eye is immediately drawn uh, toward like the brighter, whiter lights, right? The, the, the very bright lights, that's where my eye goes. And then I scan the rest of you. In this painting, your eye is probably drawn here, up toward the top, it's lighter. Um, and if you notice, that's a building. And I know that's a building because the lines are pretty clear up here. And yeah, okay, yeah, this is a build. Oh, these are buildings in lower Manhattan, New York, cool but work your way down the painting. If you start at the top, work your way down. The colors get darker, the lines get less sharp. Not that these are very sharp, you know, crisp lines to begin with, but the lines get even more chaotic, right? The, uh, this thing, which I'm assuming is like a railway, I don't even know what this is supposed to be, but it, it doesn't finish. It like just kind of bleeds out into the end, right? Um, you have all this chaos down here. What are these lines What are, and, and these darker colors? Is that a person? I don't know. I am not skilled to understand. But what I do know is, again, think about the, the, what the, we just said. The 1920s art tends to be more about the mood, more about the feeling, more about the emotions than the reality, right? This is not, John Marin's not, you know, like 75% blind and painting New York as he thinks it actually looks. He is painting what he, what he views, how he sees New York feeling, right? It may be clearer. It may be, for lack of a better word, lighter up here. But as you work your way to the city floor, as you work your way through the city, it gets darker, it gets more complicated, right? Again, I don't understand a ton about art, but I can understand this painting. I can see how this painting fits in the 1920s. 
Let's look at this one. Crisscross conveyors, Char Charles Sheeler, 1927. Um, that is a photograph. That is not a painting. Uh, Charles Sheeler was a painter and a photographer. Um, and this is from a series. He was commissioned by the Ford Motor Company to take photos uh, for their factories and offices. Um, and this is one he took. Again, neither of these photos convey happiness or joy or hope, right? There's nothing light about these images. Both of these images are pretty ominous, pretty dark, right? Look at this one. Even, even up here, the, again, the, your eye is drawn to, toward brightness, right? So even up here, if my eye is drawn here, it's immediately met by these smokestacks which rise above everything else. They, they, they stand resolute above everything else. The lines in this one are sharp. The contrast is high though. You have this light and these very clear dark regions. You have again, light, very clear darkness, light, very clear darkness. You have sharp lines, harsh lines that cross each other, that cast shadows over each other, right? Again, the, the mood of this image is very dark and ominous, foreboding even. And then we have this one, Automat, Edward uh, Hopper, 1927. Even this one, this one, we've got some color in it, right? It's got, it's got some more color. It's pretty clear. Like that's a, that's a decent painting of a woman in, in a cafe, right? Like, like this one is, is more realistic than Lower Manhattan was, right? But even then, look at this painting, right? We're all... We, we all know how light works, right? We know that there aren't a row of lights hanging from the sky outside this window. So we know these lights are inside this cafe or wherever she is. They're inside the cafe and it's the reflection in the window. So if that's the reflection of the lights inside, this artist, Edward Hopper is portraying outside of this cafe as pitch blackness. There's nothing happening out there. It's, it's dark. Even inside, where there is light, we have a woman that doesn't look happy. We have a woman by herself. This isol again, this theme, this pattern of isolation is coming through in the painting. Right? We see it. These are clear examples of these themes of, of, of fragmentation, isolation. Right, none of these images, right? When I think of, again, my limited understanding of art, if I was gonna hang something in a baby's nursery, right? I am not hanging things that are dark and moody, right? In a baby's nursery, I'm probably gonna hang things that are fun and, and light, right? That are, that are happy-ish, right? This painting's not going in a baby's nursery. Like I'm not putting it there, right? That's not the mood I think, that I would put in a baby's nursery. So that's how I know that this, this is not a very hopeful image, right? Like this, this image doesn't make me feel happy. Okay. And again, those of you that are creative and artistically minded, um, I know I am butchering the correct words that I am supposed to use to describe art, but congratulations. All of you survived Art 101 with Mr. Tucker there. We will now move on to things I know more about writers, poets. So writing styles in the 1920s uh, varied widely in style and subject matter, right? And this makes sense. Uh, we have writers today, all different genres, right? There's, there's many different genres of, of writing. Um, you can't really just classify, you know, oh, all writers write like this and everybody has their own style. In the 1920s, that wide variety and that wide style, they fit the theme again, it's fragmented, right? It, it, everybody is doing their own thing and it makes sense. There are some common themes amongst writings in the 1920s. Many writers, many writers in the 1920s tended to criticize class pretensions, consumerism and the pursuit of material goods. Many of these writings in the 1920s are critical of this newfound consumerism, right? Remember, this is the era of the electric shaver and, and the electric washing machine and refrigerator and all these things you didn't know you needed like sliced bread, right? Like 
Listerine. Remember that crazy ad that that you know that poor girl, always the bridesmaid, never the bride, because her breath stank, right? Like that. This is the era of of just unfounded, unneeded pursuit of material goods, right? People have more money, they have more time, they're buying stuff, and a lot of these writers are hypercritical of that, right? They're hypercritical of these people who think that they've 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 gone up in society. This pretension right? Pretension, being pretentious, right, is often something that is meant, is, is trying to be um, classier or um, trying to be fancier than it really is, right? It's a pretension. You're making a pretension to class. Um, oftentimes, right, you see people um, that they get a little bit of money and they start buying things and they think they're amongst the elite and the rich, right? Um, and they don't fit in with the elite and the rich. And they also don't fit in anymore with the, the lower classes, right? They're, they're kind of in this weird middle. And that's what a lot of people in the 1920s were, right? They had a little bit more money now and they, they started trying to live these lives that they, they had heard about or they'd seen the wealthy living, right? And it just, it's not fitting. It's not working. And so a lot of these writers uh, are writing about this. They're cr critical of these things. And on a positive side, right, being critical of these things really encouraged readers of their works to seriously consider how modern life was changing things, right? It asked the reader to seriously consider these changes in their life. Were they pursuing material goods more than, uh, say, relationships and people, right? It, it, it called uh, the reader to reckon with that side of themselves, right? But on the flip side, um, these writings in the 1920s often tried to portray modern life as meaningless. They often per, uh, described moral progress as impossible and that people were losing their relationships and connections to one another. Again, it's this they're pointing out this pursuit of material items versus relationships, right? The commentary there being that prior to the 1920s, it was more important to have people in your life than stuff. And now all of a sudden in this new consumer age, people are, are going out and seeking the stuff and they're, they're uh, neglecting those personal connections, right? And, and in that way, modern life was meaningless. That the, the, the commentary there is that these goods, things are meaningless, right? Stuff is never gonna make you happy. There's always gonna be more stuff to have. If, you're, if your pursuit of happiness is the pursuit of stuff, you're never going to be satisfied because there's always more stuff that you could have. And in that way, for, the, for these writers, life was meaningless. The way that modern life was evolving and, and coming about was pointless because you were never going to be satisfied. And while that's, a, a, it's a good message, right? It's a, it's a decent message of like, stuff is not gonna make you happy. Cherish the people in your life. The problem is, when people read it, it implied to them that there was little purpose to life, right? They, they didn't really look deeper. They settled for life being meaningless and therefore there was no reason to try and achieve anything. And so you end up with a lot of people who just kind of stop, right? Like they're just like, well, hey, if life is meaningless, I might as well just go with the flow, right? If none of this is gonna get better, I might as well just go with it. And you see a lot of people get caught in this trap of just being satisfied with mediocrity, being satisfied with the way things were, right? That there was no point in trying to fix it. Now, again, this is not everybody. We're not painting in broad strokes here. We're, we're saying that for many, not all, many Americans, this became a reality for them. And a lot of these writers, a lot of these writers get lumped into this category or this description of uh, the lost generation. It refers specifically to American writers that were disillusioned by World War I. They were disillusioned by the consumerism in the country when they came back from the war. And so a lot of them, they, they, they look at America and the America they knew, it doesn't, they don't know it anymore, right? They've gone off, they've seen horrible violence, they've seen death. And they come back to an America that doesn't look the way it looked and they don't really know where they fit. And so a lot of them 
leave. They move to Paris. They live as expatriates in Paris in the 1920s. And they, a lot of these guys write. They write some of the greatest American novels. Some of the novels that we hold up as the standard of, of classic American writing, they write them from Paris. They, can't, they couldn't stand to live in America. There was, they didn't feel like there was a place for them in the United States. And so they left and they moved to Paris. They got this nickname, The Lost Generation, from, from American writer Gertrude Stein. She had an apartment in, in Paris that became the home away from home for a lot of these writers. A lot of them found community amongst each other. People like Hemingway and F. Scott Fitzgerald, who we'll talk about in a minute. But they felt like the country wasn't the same. They felt like there was no place for them. And again, a lot of it brought on by, by this violence that they witnessed in World War I. To go from, from a battlefield and seeing that the chaos to coming back and watching people pursue things over people, it, 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 it struck them. So let's look at three of them quickly. Uh, the first one here, we, first writer we want to look at, there's many writers of the 1920s. There are plenty of poets, playwrights. Uh, we could, we, we could, I mean, you could literally in, in college, if you are interested in literature and the evolution of American literature, uh, you will take courses where you will study more of these people, right? So I'm, I'm not leaving them out because they're not important. Um, we could just literally spend so much time on just these writers. So uh, here are three that... Um, you need to know about. So number one is Sinclair Lewis. Uh, Lewis has three distinct characteristics about his writing. His writing is very detailed. He relies a lot on satire uh, and he relies a lot on realism. His books, uh, are his characters are highly detailed. The amount of detail he tells you about their backstory, about their, their features, their who they are, their decisions. Um, his books, his works, highly detailed. They're based highly in this, this desire to portray realistic characters. He's not writing uh, like Hallmark movie characters that could not possibly exist, right? Like that classic Hallmark scenario, which is basically the plot line to every Hallmark movie uh, where, you know, small town guy or gal grows up, leaves small town, goes to big city, becomes a big shot in the big city, comes back for Christmas in the small town, gets snowed in, meets this high school friend that they haven't seen in years and they're living in the small town doing the small town thing and by the end of the movie big town person figures or big city person figures out that life in the small town is better and they stay and they fall in love and one of them is probably santa's kid or santa's nephew right like that's the plot line to every hallmark movie that's not Sinclair Lewis's style of writing these characters he want he wanted his readers to be able to 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 feel as if they could really know these characters, that they could walk to their uh, local you know, store or walk down the street and really meet these characters, that these characters could live the lives that his readers were living. Great detail, great amount of satire. Again, satire being uh, you know, over, over, um, overtly comical, right? Using, um, using humor, right, to poke fun, right, but, but doing it in a way that is, is subtle, right, sarcasm uh, and satire, think SNL skits, right, um, that's satire. A major theme in his writing is the powerlessness of society, the powerlessness of, of the common man, you and me, to change things, the, the powerlessness of, of society to change its reality. He was the first American to win the Nobel Prize for Literature, mainly because of his detailed characters. Some notable works of his, Main Street and Babbitt, if you're interested in, in looking into his works. Ernest Hemingway is the next one. Again, one of these lost generation writers. Uh, his writings focus on one theme, the search for the meaning of life during a time filled with violence. Again, he was very much influenced and shaped by the violence he witnessed in World War I. 
And his writings reflect that. They reflect this, again, this search for the meaning of life in a time filled with such violence. When the world is, is chaotic and violent, how can life have meaning? That's what his books and his works focus on. Hemingway has a very simple and direct style. He, he spent years as a journalist prior to, to going into the more creative writings. Um, and his writing is very plain, very simple, very direct, right? It, it's not full of flowery language. It's not full of, of, of metaphors and, and, you know, all of those other literary devices. It's very plain. That's not to say that it's boring by any means, but it's a very direct style of writing. It's the difference between reading uh, a newspaper column versus reading like a magazine article. Right or reading a, a a nonfiction work versus reading a fictional work. Right, they tend to have very different styles. In this case, his is very direct, very uh, simple. Works of his, if you're interested, uh, the sun also rises, a farewell to arms, and for whom the bell tolls. A farewell to arms uh, is one he wrote, uh, uh, and for whom the bell tolls. They're both uh, military um, uh, fi works of fiction. They both have to deal with. Um, Again, that, that experience of violence and, and the aftermath of life after that. Um, and then finally, F. Scott Fitzgerald. F. Scott Fitzgerald, uh, best known for his works about the superficiality of society in the 1920s. Again, pu uh, com public, or, uh, excuse me, social commentary on uh, this consumer culture, on the shallowness of this, of this whole thing. If Hemingway is simple and direct, F. Scott Fitzgerald is the complete opposite when he writes. His writing is dense, it is complex. His writing creates a, a sense of mystery and doom and tragedy, but it's all couched, it's all covered in this appearance of blissful, blissful romance. Um, spring semester, you should be reading Great Gatsby in your English classes. Um, and Great Gatsby, if you there's a film of it too. So if you've if you've already read the book or you've seen the movie, um, Great Gatsby can appear again on the surface level can appear like a very um, well, a ve for lack of a better way of saying, it, a very romantic film. Like it, it can the 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 detail, the costuming, the 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 lifestyle, right? The parties, the all the elegance. Right there's an elegance about Gatsby, but when you actually read Gatsby and you look at the you look below the surface, there is this very dark, very uh, complex, uh, you know, plot line that I don't want to ruin for you because again, you're going to read the book. Um, but it's it's very indicative of the 1920s. Again, if you look at the surface, Gatsby in the 1920s can look elegant. They can look uh, like, again, blissful. But when you dig deeper, when you really dive into the, to the details of the plot uh, or the details of the 1920s, you see the underbelly that is really not as blissful, right? But it, it has this appearance. Fitzgerald uh, is a brilliant writer in that way, a brilliant, uh, brilliant wordsmith, able to really uh, just craft these scenarios and these settings that draw you in, and when you and and it's it's, it's fantastic. So um, I hope you'll enjoy the book when you read it. Um, his notable uh, of his notable works, uh, Gatsby's the third novel he wrote. Um, Gatsby was not very popular when he was alive. It wasn't until he was dead uh, that Gatsby really climbed in popularity to the point now that um, the Great Gatsby is uh, one of the the most assigned texts in uh, in schools in the nation. Um, one of the most assigned texts. Um, another work of his, again, he wrote plenty, um, but Fitzgerald is a complicated guy. He, he wrote a lot about the superficiality of society in the 1920s and commented a lot about this pursuit of stuff, um, but he was caught up in it himself. Um, he liked a certain lifestyle, um, particularly a boozy lifestyle. And I didn't say bougie, I said boozy. Uh, he liked, he liked his drink and um, he needed to afford it. And so he took to writing uh, short stories when his novels uh, stopped you know, selling as well. Um, 
he, he wrote a lot of short stories. And one of them that I thought you might know um, is The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. Again, that's a, another, um, it's a short story of his. It was recently made into a film. I think it's Matt Damon. I think it's Matt Damon that plays Benjamin Button. I could be totally wrong about that. But I know it's a film that they just uh, recently made, like maybe 2018, 2017. Um, but that is based on a short story by F. Scott Fitzgerald. So there you go. All right. Let's move on to pop culture. Keep in mind the economic prosperity and new technologies in the 1920s. We've talked about this. They provided many Americans with extra money to spend and more time for leisure, right? We've talked about this. I've beaten this horse over the head. In the 1920s, people had more money to spend and they had more time to, to spend that money in, right? And so we see the rise of mass culture or popular culture or pop culture, however you want to, whatever you want to call it. Um, and, and this rise of mass culture really distinguishes the 1920s from previous eras. This rise in, in mass culture, what is mass culture? Mass culture is, is, is uh, culture that, again, the masses can, can partake in. For the first time in American history, you have people in rural Oklahoma who can tune in on the radio and listen to Babe Ruth, uh, launching bombs into the outfield, right? While the person in New York, who's maybe like a five minute train ride from the stadium is also listening to the same thing, right? Mass culture has the ability to unite the masses. It has the ability to draw people from all different walks of life, all different socioeconomic backgrounds, all different ethnic backgrounds, right? Entertainment is a great unifier. You can be from various different walks of life but you can enjoy the same film. Think about it. Today, when you meet a stranger, you often engage in small talk, right? You don't just dive into really deep life things with somebody you just met, right? You tend to have small talk. And your small talk, if it's not about the weather, uh, tends to be about pop culture things, a TV show, sports, whatever, right? You try to find some common ground usually in the form of mass culture or pop culture, whatever you want to call it, right? Whether it's a, a, a you know, you both like the same music or you both uh, have in common that you like a particular actor or actress or, or you like a particular show or movie or whatever, right? Um, you, you try to find that very basic point of connection to be able to continue that relationship. Mass culture allows that to happen. The spreading of, of this mass uh, culture, new movies, radio shows, sports, all of that allows that to happen. And so for the first time, millions of Americans began regularly watching sports, going to concerts, attending the theater, and watching movies, right? And the key word there is regularly. People attended things beforehand, but this, this, these new entertainments become a regular part of life. They're happening more often, right? Um, and when I say concerts there, I don't mean rock concerts, mostly because rock and roll didn't exist. But when I say concerts there, I mean like, you know, orchestra performances, you know, classical things, uh, jazz performances, which we'll talk about jazz on uh, Friday. When we talk about the Harlem Renaissance, we'll talk about jazz as well. So let's talk movies and radio shows. Films of the 1920s reflect, mostly reflected the issues and characteristics of the era. And that feels like a no dub, but like, think about it. In, in 2020, most movies coming out aren't set in 2020. We like a lot of like sci-fi, right? We like superhero movies set off in a galaxy far away or in, you know, alternate parallel universes, right? We don't see a lot of movies made today that are about today, right? Like we might get a pandemic. I'm sure we'll get some sort of pandemic movie in the next, you know, few months. I'm sure we'll get some movie about living in a, you know, living in quarantine. Like I'm sure we'll get some movies about that. But for the most part, the movies that come out, the movies that are made don't tend to reflect today. They're not usually about today, right? Um, again, we see things like sci-fi, we see throwback pieces, right? We see all those things, but in the 1920s in particular, the majority of the movies looked like life in the 1920s. They, the characters were meant to reflect people you could actually know. Better yet, they were meant to reflect people that you could aspire to be. 
a lot of the, these movies dealt with stories of World War I and its aftermath and its impact, right? Something very real, very much happening to these people uh, as they're living life, right? Um, stories about complicated relationships between men and women, right? Well, that's happening in the 1920s. That relationship structure is changing. And so these movies are movies that reflect that reality. A lot of these stories are about liberated women, right? A lot of these, you get a lot of flapper movies and a lot of those flapper movies star the new it girl, right? We have the rise of the celebrity uh, actor and actress, right? And in this case, the it girl for these flapper films is Clara Bow, right? If you've ever seen moving movie footage from the 1920s, uh, containing a, a, a woman dressed as a flapper. Or, you know, it's probably Clara Bow. At the same time, you also see many religious films focused on very overtly Christian themes, dramatic retellings of stories from the Bible meant to communicate these, these values, right? Think about that again, that tension the tension between the changing uh, liberated woman and comp complex relationships and changes in society. And then on the other side, you have these religious fundamental uh, ideals. And again, they're present in the movies of the 1920s. Most of these films are silent films, right? Which means that there's no words coming out of the actor's mouths. Their mouths may move, but there's no words. You don't hear the words. And so instead they often had a piano player that would play the soundtrack, right? To give you the mood and, and, you know, when there was action, you know, the music would get faster. And when there was, you know, you know, a lovey-dovey scene, right? The music might slow down, right? But that music with the soundtrack was the only thing you had in those films. And then there would often be subtitles, right? So if there was a major plot thing that you needed to know, right? It's a silent film. How are you supposed to know? Well, there would be a subtitle that would pop up. Sometimes these movies had subtitles for the lines. So like the actor's mouths would move and they would move like not even close to what the subtitles would say. And then the subtitles would pop up and like, that's what they said, you know? Um, but most often they were used for plot twists and whatnot. That is until 1927. In 1927, we get the first talking picture, the jazz singer. It's the first film that has sound to it, right? And you can hear the actor. Now that's about all I'm gonna say about the jazz singer because the jazz singer is a very controversial film. The jazz singer we celebrate because it is the first talking picture, right? Today, I'm sure all of you would prefer to go to the movie theater um, and hear the actor's lines and hear the actual things happening than listen to it, you know, sit in a room with a silent thing happening and you know a piano player right i'm sure we all appreciate what we know today as movies right and that's that starts with the jazz singer so we like give it a quick golf clap uh because it's the first one but the jazz singer is complicated because it is a film about an african-american jazz player but the star of the movie is played by a white man in blackface. And you have to ask yourself, if they're gonna make a movie, right? We're gonna talk about jazz on Friday. Jazz takes the world by storm. Black, white, Italian, it didn't matter. Jazz takes over this nation. Jazz becomes so popular Clearly, right? They make a movie about jazz. But jazz is a distinctly African-American contribution to the world of music and art. It is a distinctly uh, American Southern flavor of music, right? It's born in, in New Orleans. It is, it is distinctly made by the African-American community. So why not have an African-American actor in this movie? Well, you have to ask yourself, why did Shakespeare not have women in his, in his plays? When Shakespeare wrote plays, when, when Romeo and Juliet was playing in a theater, when it first was written, why were there young prepubescent boys playing Juliet? Well, women weren't allowed to be actors. And the same is true in the 1920s for African-Americans. African-Americans weren't allowed to be in these films with white actors. 
segregation was absolutely in place. And so instead, these white actors, these filmmakers, they made money off of this distinctly African-American contribution to the world. They made money by putting white actors in blackface. playing off these racial stereotypes, playing off these character tropes. And so again, the jazz singer, yeah, it's the first talking picture. We recognize that, we golf clap it, thank you. And then we move on because again, the reality is they shut out, they made money off of a distinctly African-American contribution while shutting African-Americans out of the process of the creative process of, of the profit of the the, the 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 recognition they should have gotten for that contribution radio broadcasts right today we have television and the move and, and movies right there's the the silver screen and the golden screen right back then you just had movies and you had radio and radio broadcasts offered everything from classical music to comedy shows they offered everything in between different you know children's programs, family programs, mysteries, right? They offered all sorts of different programs. But again, it's radio, there's no image. And so you have to rely a lot on voice. And so these comedy shows tended to rely heavily on racial stereotypes. Many of the most popular shows in the comedy genre of radio in the 1920s had to do with racial stereotypes. One in particular was a, a two white men, again, playing African-Americans in the deep South, relying on vocal stereotypes and other stereotypes to get a laugh. Things today that, that we, don't, we don't find okay today, right? Now, again, this is the slippery slope and we have to be careful with it. Because in, as historians, our job is not to apply today's cultural and social standards to the past, right? So hear me, while I'm not showing you the jazz singer and I'm not playing clips of these very popular radio shows, right? Stuff that when I was in high school, they showed us, right? When I was in high school, we watched a clip of the jazz singer. We listened to these clips of these radio shows. And I'm not showing you those. I'm not doing that. Right, because they have behaviors in them that I don't want to promote, that today are not culturally and socially acceptable. But we don't, we, what we can't do, what we have to be very careful of is we cannot apply today's social standards to the time. We can't judge them for a lot of these behaviors. Because again, at the time, that was what was socially accepted. They weren't doing it, uh, not, in, not all of them, Right, very much so. Some of them were absolutely racist and, and everything else. But not everybody was doing it because they didn't like African Americans or they didn't like these other cultures, right? A lot of it was just part of the time, right? And so we have to go back and look at the motivation. Not everybody was motivated by uh, trying to be insulting and whatnot, right? Some of them were just genuinely playing a part. Today, we have the option of whether to, or not to show that. I'm not gonna show it. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give that time. But again, that doesn't mean that these were bad people. That doesn't mean that they were all, you know, terrible, horrible people. It just means that that's not something we're going to do today. Together, radio, movies, newspapers, magazines, all of these are part of what gets known as mass media, right? And mass media not only entertained America, but it also fostered a sense of a shared experience. Again, you could meet a total stranger from a different part of the world, from a different part of the country, with a different ethnic background, from different social, socioeconomic backgrounds. And if you had seen the same movie, you could talk about it, right? It unifies the nation in a time where the nation is very fragmented. Again, where unions and labor are, are, are excuse me, unions and the bosses are at war where you have the government and business con in conflict, where you have the entire agricultural sector asking for help and nobody responding. In a time of fragmentation, mass media helps to unify the nation. And along with that is sports. Motion pictures and radio 
helped to propel baseball and boxing and other sports to new heights of popularity. If you've ever seen video footage of Babe Ruth swinging a bat, it's not because it was on TV because there was no TV. It's because somebody recorded it uh, for uh, the same way they would record a movie and they would show these games, they'd replay them and replay these clips in movie theaters again. They, 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 and they broadcast these games on the radio, right? For the first time you could be uh, living in California, listening to the radio and you could hear about these monster moonshots that, that Babe Ruth was hitting, right? You could be, a, if you were a boxing fan, you could live uh, far away from where the fight was happening and you could still listen to it, right? It gave rise for the first time in this country to the celebrity athlete, right? For the first time, the, the careers of guys like Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, right? These big names in, in, in sports, they don't, they didn't exist prior to the 1920s. In the 1920s, you have the, the rise of this celebrity athlete. Again, Babe Ruth becomes one of the most popular athletes. Everybody's waiting to hear what the Bambino is going to do next. Jack Dempsey is a world heavyweight champion in boxing. That's, uh, that's Babe Ruth and Dempsey in that top photo there. He's the world heavyweight champion, 1919 to 1926, becomes a household name. Right today, people pay a ton of money for pay-per-view to watch, you know, MMA and boxing matches, right? Be back then, they just listened to a radio, and they listened to the fight there. Jack Dempsey got so popular, in fact, that when he lost his world heavyweight title in 26, he scheduled a fight in 1927 to, to try and get back his heavyweight title, and a single store... A single store, not, not across the nation, one single store sold more than $90,000 of radio equipment before one of Dempsey's fights. Again, the radio, movies, this mass media takes the nation by storm. For the first time in American history, college football, golf, and tennis are popular. Professional football was not a thing. Most people in the country at the time did not like football. They thought it was violent. They thought it was too aggressive. Which is why I maintain that baseball is America's pastime, not football. Don't at me. But college football, because of the radio, college football gains popularity. Mostly the University of Illinois is a very popular football school at the time. But again, you, give, you get the rise of these college athletes, this rise of interest in, in international golfing, in national tennis matches. Shoot, the whole world listened as Gertrude Ederle swam the English Channel in 1927 and shattered previous time records for doing so. There was this hunger for what was new and what was now possible. The radio changes entertainment. The radio, movies, newspapers, this mass media culture acts as a, as a unifier for a nation that is fragmented. And that, that is the point, right? If you have to summarize, which you do in five sentences, but if you had to summarize, why this stuff matters. Why are we looking at the art? Why are we talking about the writing? Why are we talking about this stuff? It's because the, the art, the creativity of the time absolutely reflects the tension that existed in the 1920s. It absolutely reflects the tension between the, 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 the traditional and the new, right? It reflects this, this societal tension between the urban and the rural. But even amongst all of that tension, even amongst all of that chaos, people disagreeing, people you know, fighting with each other, even amidst all of that, you have this ability for Americans to unite around something. 
right? Even in the chaos, there's something that they can unite around. And in this case, it becomes mass media. It becomes these new entertainments. It becomes these new artistic outlets. And so while the art and the writing reflect the era, so too does the American spirit of unity around entertainment. You could argue that entertainment today is still largely the main unifier in a nation that is truly divided. You could argue that entertainment is, is one of the, the things that unifies us still today. Music is a major unifier. It's a global unifier. Think about, about the popularity of K-pop in the United States, right? Most people who love K-pop in the United States don't speak Korean. They, don't, they can't understand the words to the songs, but they, they, the music, is what moves them. And that's, that's, that's the, the point here, right? Even in the chaos, there's something that is still able to unify the nation. All right, that is that. We will talk about the Harlem, we will finish this unit with the Harlem Renaissance, the advent of jazz on Friday. Right now, We've got about eight minutes, so I just want you to take some time. Um, 